Good day, everybody. Happy Thursday, the 21st of October. This is Ron Evans, and this is going to be my weekly market matters update. If you've paid attention to some of the previous ones of this, you know that Market Matters is a publication that comes out from CAR, California Association of Realtors, weekly. And I just want to briefly go through all the different articles that they highlight and kind of let you know what I think might be worth reading and understanding. And at the end of the day, you make up your mind. I will always include the links to these articles in the show notes and in the description of the podcast. If you are checking this out on YouTube, this is going to be audio only. But it still will be available on YouTube. As always, any questions or comments you have, please leave them below in whatever format you are listening or watching. And I will answer them in a timely manner. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or topics of discussion, please email me at realestate101 at ronevansrealty.com. You can also shoot me a text message at 949-929-2270. All right, let's dive into it. Oh, last thing. Going forward, I'm going to do these podcasts on Mondays. So we'll do it as a Market Matters Mondays type of a theme. Diving in. All right. On this current Market Matters, the first article comes from Bloomberg. It's sourced from Bloomberg and it's buying a second or third home is more popular than ever. And it talks about uh, with the rise of remote working, second homes are becoming a viable option for more buyers seeking a better work-life balance. Nearly one in five respondents to a Knight Franklin Global Buyer Survey said they moved the start of, at the start of the pandemic. And one in three said they were more likely to buy a second home as a result of the pandemic, up from 26% the prior year. What's contributing? Well, it's the low interest rates on home loans, pandemic era savings, and a hybrid work revolution. That's what's made it more feasible for people, not just the ultra rich to live a dual lifestyle. The fundamental change in where and how people live stands to infuse second home markets, once reliant on weekenders and seasonal visitors with greater demand for restaurants, retail, and other amenities that make urban dwelling so appealing. So let's unlock that just a little bit. Just in the primary home buying, home selling market, since the pandemic began, we have experienced a lot of people that are basically permanently working from home never to return to an office and they are realizing that they are not stuck they are no longer stuck in maybe the city the zip code the state what have you that they can now feel free to move to another area maybe to be closer to family something more affordable that meets their means and their budget or allows them more flexibility for raising a family or what have you. We're experiencing a lot of that here in Orange County and in Southern California, where believe it or not, we are getting people coming from the Bay Area, Seattle, East Coast, who look at our market, believe it or not, as more affordable than where they're at. And they now realize that, hey, I I don't have to stay where I'm at. I'm going to be working from home permanently. I don't have to leave my job to venture out for what I think is a better life for me or my family. So 
with this article, it's also talking about people that are buying multiple homes now, buying that that secondary home. And you see this a lot. Um, it used to be that when people lived in the Midwest, I'm, I'm from Arizona, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona originally. And it used to be that people in the Midwest and on the East Coast would buy second homes in my home state and in my home city, but it was mostly retired people that would do that because they could freely spend their winter months in Arizona and their summer and spring months at home in their in their home state, Chicago or Minnesota or you know New York or, or whatever. But what this article is getting at is that it doesn't just have to be left to those what they call weekenders um, and seasonal visitors. Now, if, if someone lives in Illinois or Indiana or Minnesota or somewhere in the Midwest where it gets really, really cold and snowy in the winter and they're a work from home, they're not retired, well, they can find the means to buy a second home and split their time during the year, even though they're still working. And as a deeper dive into this article, what that's talking, what it's talking about is that it's going to, because of this, you may see new construction in places that you haven't seen as much new construction, which will lead to more infrastructure needed, demand for things like retail and restaurants, parks, all those things that, that go hand in hand with that. So at the end of the day, it might, you know, try to balance out jobs and create more jobs and flexibility in those industries. I think it's fascinating to look at. It uh, shows that um, in the face of a pandemic, which is and was a terrible thing to have to go through that it shows how, how resilient we can be and how as a society we can pivot and start making the most out of what the future is going to bring us great article i highly encourage you to to, to click on this one and um, and read more about it yourself so the next article is uh coming from the California Association of Realtors. So if you're outside of California, this may or may not be applicable to you. Um, you may read it because your, mar or, uh, your market is similar to ours, or maybe you're looking for a move and you wanna understand it. But um, this is talking about how the California housing market has rebounded in September. California home sales closed out the third quarter by reversing a four month decline and posting the largest monthly increase in more than a year. This is brought to you again by the California Association of Realtors. Quote, as we move into the off home buying season, we should see market competition easing and home prices moderating, giving those who waited out the highly competitive market earlier this year an opportunity to revisit buying. That comes from CARS president Dave Walsh. He goes on to say, interest rates are expected to remain low and the availability of homes for sale should improve, which should boost home buying interest and spur sales. Now, I'm not gonna lie, if you listen to or watch what I posted yesterday, which is our local Orange County housing market update that comes from Stephen Thomas and his reports on housing, that's gonna conflict a little bit with what we're reading here for the state as a whole. So where I'm at, we're looking at an all, almost an all time low in houses being available. We're going into our slow season where people that haven't been able to sell their home, and yes, there are some that haven't, are gonna go ahead and pull their homes off the market and maybe revisit next year. But those buyers are still there. So, this may or may not hold water, truthfully, in all of California. 
as a, as a whole in California, it may, and in actually in other markets, this may. So in other states and other cities and other counties, this may be the, what you will see. Where I'm at personally, it may or may not be uh, what we see. But I would say that typically this would be what we would see, but just not this year. We'll have to, uh, I, I would encourage you guys, if you're local here, um, weigh in on that. I would like to get your opinion. Go back and also kind of listen and listen to the breakdown of uh, the full Orange County housing report that I posted. And uh, let me know if you're thinking what I'm thinking, that this may not jive for where we're at, but it may jive for other parts of California and other parts of our country. Next article, lenders are courting self-employed again. Well, 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 this comes from Housing Wire. Mortgage credit availability increased for the third consecutive month in September, but is still 30% below the pre-pandemic level, according to a report by the Mortgage Bankers Association. Much of the growth in credit availability has come from loans that cater to self-employed borrowers who were left in the cold by most lenders during the pandemic. The MBA Mortgage Credit Availability Index overall rose by 1.5% to 125.6 in September, the highest level since May. The index benchmarks to 100 in March of 2012, a higher number portends more mortgage credit availability. Now, if you're a numbers person, if you're a money person, this article will really speak to you. On my level, working as an agent, I can tell you that this is a great thing. Um, when the pandemic hit last year, I was specifically working with three self-employed buyers. All of them had been approved for a loan and we were actively searching. One of them I was actively writing contracts for, hadn't found the right one yet. As soon as the pandemic hit, Banks completely did a 180 on what they were doing with the self-employed and all three of my buyers lost their approval. Couldn't get them approved anywhere. So this is really good to see that things are coming full circle now and we're starting to get back to normal for the people that are self-employed. It's been, a, it's been really hard for them um, for the last year and a half to, to buy because of what happened early on in the pandemic. It really crushed a lot of people. So it's really good to see this. Um, I will be interested to see if we can get back to the pre-pandemic level before, you know, maybe by, by springtime we will, but uh, I'll be interested to see how long it takes us to actually get that, that far. Um, I don't know what the reasons are yet of why we're not back to the pre-pandemic level since the banks have become more favorable, why people haven't jumped on it. I don't know if it's, if it's industry issue or job issue or where the, where the negativity lies at this point, but it's good to see that we are recovering there. Okay, this next article comes from realtor.com. And it is home buyers using government loans struggle to compete. Government backed loans have long been known to help low income and first time home buyers make a low down payment on a home purchase. But these loans often come with several extra requirements that may slow the process and put some at a disadvantage in a fast paced offer situation. 89% of sellers would likely would be likely to accept an offer from a buyer with conventional financing, but only 30% would be willing to accept one using a Federal Housing Administration, FHA, or Veterans Affairs, VA, loan. According to an April survey, so this goes back a little bit, of real estate professionals conducted by the National Association of Realtors. 6% of agents say their sellers would not consider an offer using a government-backed loan. I have a lot that I could say on this, and quite 
truthfully, I could probably do a whole episode on this. Um, I don't know who the agents are that were surveyed, if they are new agents or if they are seasoned agents. But in my opinion, and again, this is my opinion, if agents are answering on behalf of their sellers that their sellers would not want to accept an offer that was FHA or VA, it is because that agent has not educated their seller properly on FHA and VA. Now it is true that there could be some extra things that come with those loans for the buyer that can make it a little bit slower. You know, you're not gonna get, in my experience, you're not gonna be able to do like a, a seven day appraisal or waive an appraisal for sure. You may not get a 21 day close of escrow, a 30 day close of escrow is stretching it for some, but more likely it's gonna be a traditional 45 day. So I get that part of it. But it all comes back to how we as agents educate and inform our sellers. If you talk to your seller confidently about an offer, your seller will feel confident about that offer, no matter where it's coming from. Let's look at VA, for instance. The government wants our veterans to be able to buy a home. Now, are there a few extra hoops that the buyer has to jump through? Yes. But the government wants that deal to close. They are not going to do things typically that blindside the buyer or the seller that squashes a deal. When you work with a VA buyer, in my opinion, they are fantastic buyers. Fantastic buyers. Might they be financing 100% because that's what a VA loan is designed for? Yes, but the lender will have gone through all those guidelines up front. You shouldn't feel nervous about it as a seller or as an agent. If the lender is good, and the buyer's agent is good and everyone's been educated on the process, you should feel very comfortable accepting a VA offer. Again, there are extra hoops to jump through for the buyer. It may take longer than some others, but I find personally, I find VA buyers to be less let's just call it troublesome or I don't want to say the word picky. That might not be the right word, but when they get into a deal from the fact that the government wants to make sure the deal closes, the bank wants to make sure the deal closes, the agent wants to make sure the deal closes. And I guarantee you the VA buyer wants to do everything they can to get the deal closed because of the fact that there is this crazy perception out there that they are difficult deals. In my opinion, it's just not true. There are some minimum standards that a house has to meet for an inspection and an appraisal. You're not gonna get, like I said before, you're not gonna get crazy appraisal situations from FHA or VA. It has to be a habitable home. Things have to be working. So it's not for every home, but if, if you live in a good home that you're selling, and it's at market value and the offers at market value and you're not worried about all these other things, you shouldn't be worried about an FHA or VA loan. I definitely would like to hear back from people on that one to see if anyone has experienced something different. But typically when I see things online of other agents in other parts of the country or whatever, like worried about FHA and VA, it, it always comes back to how they're educated and how they pass on that education to their client. Remember, we work for them, but as part of our job is to make sure that 
at least how I look at it, is you take on a lot of that extra responsibility for making sure that the client understands fully what the deal is. All right, this next article comes from Market Watch. And if you are renting, if you are a property owner of rental properties, you're probably really gonna wanna read this. Or if you're looking at becoming a property owner of rental properties, you're gonna wanna definitely read this article. Rents post biggest increase since 2006. The surging demand for rental units is pushing up prices with rents of primary residences jumping by half a percent, the largest one month increase since 2001. The end of the eviction moratorium in September may also have put pressure on rents to rise, housing analysts say. Home prices also have been on the rise as demand surges in the pandemic for housing. Real house prices have been increasing about 100 times faster than they did from 1955 to 1998. This is a really, really touchy subject. I don't know what opinion to offer on this other than if you are renting, expecting to be renting, a property owner of a rental, expecting to be a property owner of a rental, you really need to educate yourself and understand what that market is. Understand why it is you're renting if you're a renter. Get fully educated on where your money is going and if you have other options. Because the, what I'm seeing is as fast as, the, like this thing says, as fast as the property values themselves are rising in, this, in the resale market, the rent is outpacing it. And it used to not be that way. It used to not be that way. The property values themselves used to outpace rent. But we're seeing a, a bit of a turn and the competition for rentals is furious right now. I only half jokingly say that if I was a renter, it would be the last thing I would be wanting to do right now is try to move and look for a new place, look for a new place, look for a new lease because it's more brutal than the house buying market right now. I definitely want some feedback on this one. If you have any, check out this article. Okay, the last one is another one about lending. It comes from CNBC. And it's weekly mortgage demand drops as rates move higher. Climbing mortgage interest rates caused another drop in mortgage demand for both refinances and home purchases. Total application volume fell 6.3% last week compared with the previous week. And that comes from the Mortgage Bankers Association. The average contract interest rate for a 30-year fixed rate mortgages with conforming loan balances increased to 3.23% from 3.18%, with points decreasing from 0.35 or decreasing 2.35 from 0.37, and that includes the origination fee for loans with a 20% down payment. That rate was 21 basis points lower the same week one year ago. Admittedly, I don't know loans very well. I do understand how they impact the market for sure. As we've had declining over the years, these last probably four or five years, how long have we had, or maybe even longer than that, that we've had these artificially low rates in the threes, low fours. 
and we've had less and less homes available to sell now over the last few years. It's just, you know, at an all time low. But we've been told and we've been, let, you know, been believing that if the rates tick up, that will actually stimulate housing. So while some might see this as a negative, some might see this as a positive, the rates incrementally start to tick up a little bit because it can get people off the fence that have been waiting to sell or waiting to buy because they keep thinking the rates are going to bottom out even further or the rates are going to stay where they're at forever. That's really all I, I can comment on it is, you know, it may not be the worst thing that the rates tick up a little bit. Um, I do find it interesting that they're saying that the slight increase dropped application demand. I also find it interesting that they combined refinances and home purchases into that percentage of applications. I would like to know if there's a breakdown of new applications versus refinance. I wonder if it's the refis that are, or, or if they're dropping more than the new. And if you broke it out even further, and again, I don't know, I have to look at some charts or talk to, talk to an expert. <clears throat> if you broke it out even further, does the drop in demand of new applications follow a typical pattern year over year? And the biggest hit is actually right now in the refis. Are they the ones dropping the most because of the rising rate? That'll be an interesting thing to look at. I'll see if I can reach out this week to uh, a good economist or, or lender that, that has, has the pulse of this. So. That is it for this week's Market Matters. Again, um, I'm going to move this to Mondays and it'll be Market Matters Mondays going forward. So look for that next week. And as always, if you have any comments, questions, you can drop them in the comments below. You can email me direct at realestate101 at ronevansrealty.com or send me a text message 949-929-2270. Thank you for listening.